Today we are going to start with the adrenals and as you know the adrenal glands they are a pair of suprarenal organs which are present just on top of the kidneys as you can appreciate over here so we are having a pair of the adrenal glands as you can see and the normal adrenal gland that you see they weigh approximately 4 to 5 gram that is the weight of a normal adrenal gland so uh, going into the microscopical microscopic examination of the adrenal glands if you look at this diagram over here so as you can appreciate the adrenals they are having two important parts on the inside they have what is called as the adrenal medulla and on the outer aspect they have the adrenal cortex okay and surrounding the adrenal gland on the outer aspect we have the adipose tissue okay and just between the adipose tissue and the cortex we also have a capsule so the adrenal if you see the adrenals they can be divided into two main halves one is the adrenal medulla as you can appreciate over here that is the inner aspect and on the outer aspect we have the adrenal cortex now why is it very important to understand this histology because there are several diseases which are arising because of tumors involving the medulla and there are other sets of disorders which are basically arising from all the hyper and hypo secretion of the cortisol from the adrenal cortex. So we are going to discuss in detail about these particular points. Okay. Now, if we, if we are going to enlarge the cortex, so this is the adrenal cortex. So everyone can appreciate over here the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex can be divided into three major regions. Okay. On the outer aspect, on the outer aspect, as you can appreciate over here, there is the zona glomerulosa. Okay. On the inner more, in the inner more aspect, you have the zona reticularis and in between, the largest section of the adrenal cortex is formed by the zona fasciculata. So as we appreciate over here, this section, the outermost area of the cortex that is facing the capsule, that is the zona glomerulosa. Now the zona glomerulosa, if you see, mainly they are composed of a small clusters and short trabeculae of a small well-defined cells, which are lipid poor. So they are not whitish in color. They are lipid poor. So these are probably the cells as we can appreciate over here. So these are probably the cells that we are watching over here. The small clusters and the short trabeculae of small well-defined cells, which are lipid poor cells form the zona glomerulosa. Now the zona glomerulosa, if you see, they are comprising only 15% of the adrenal cortex and they are basically involved okay in the secretion of what is called as mineralocorticoids basically the aldosterone okay the second important or the second inner layer just inner to the zona glomerulosa we are having the zona fasciculata as we can appreciate over here now the zona fasciculata it is comprising 70 to 80 percent of the adrenal cortex and if you see the zona fasciculata they are forming broad bands if you see all these broad bands of cells, which are basically uh, rich in the lipid. That is why their color, if you see, they are completely, you know, they are transparent in color because the fat is washed. So these are broad bands of large cells with distinct cell membranes arranged in cords. At least they are two cell wide. And the cytoplasm, if you see, shows clearing because they contain numerous small lipid vacuoles. Okay. And this zona fasciculata, as you see, they are responsible for secretion of glucocorticoid, that is the cortisol. And the zona fasciculata cells, they are lipid rich. That is why they are appearing, have a clear appearance, okay, because they contain multiple small lipid vacuoles. And very, very important uh, thing over here is that it contains, it contains a maximum number of, you know, it is basically responsible for the majority of the adrenal cortex comprising 70 to 80% of the cortex. And lastly, just uh, inner to the zona fasciculata, we have the zona reticularis. Now the zona reticularis is a part which is abutting or which is close to the adrenal medulla. Now this is comprised of haphazardly arranged cells. And these cells, though they are smaller than the zona fasciculata cells, if you see over here, 
but they are bigger compared to zona glomerulosa cells and these cells if you see they are more eosinophilic granular cytoplasm and they contain less lipid okay they are lipid poor and the basic function of this zona reticularis is the secretion of sex steroids which includes androgens as well as estrogens and progesterone so this is what is the main function of the zona reticularis so i hope this is completely crystal clear to everyone we have seen that there is an adrenal medulla and then there is an adrenal cortex okay we have just seen that the adrenal cortex can be divided into zona reticularis zona fasciculata and a very thin zona glomerulosa so from the outer aspect to the inner aspect we have already seen the different layers and we have already seen what each layer of the adrenal cortex is secreting clear to everyone now this is the gross image this is the gross image of the adrenals as we can appreciate so on the innermost aspect if you can see is the medulla which is reddish over here if you look at the cortex the cortex is pale yellow why it is yellowish color why it is yellow in color because the 70 to 80 percent of the cortex is comprised of which layer the zona fasciculata and this zona fasciculata is rich in what fat cells lipids that is why this classical color is there and on the outer aspect there is a capsule and on the outer aspect there is a supra renal fat is also present as we had already seen in the diagram now very very important thing that we have to appreciate over here that the normal adrenal gland is somewhat like this as we appreciate over here now there are different kinds of conditions which will affect the adrenal gland for example sometimes there might be hyperplasia of the adrenal gland sometimes they will have a well defined adenoma or well defined neoplastic process that is the adrenal adenoma sometimes there will be involvement by carcinoma as well so as we are going to understand the different kinds of conditions that we are going to read today we are going to understand the basic disorders now before i delve into the details before i delve into the details of uh, the adrenals i would just like to tell you one basic concept remember one thing that the hypothalamus there is a hypothalamus okay which is releasing the cortical the corticotrop releasing hormone which is acting on the pituitary okay and stimulates the anterior pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone and this is going to act on the adrenal glands okay to produce cortisol okay to produce cortisol so this is how the normal pathway of secretion of cortisol is taking place yes everyone is clear about it okay why am i saying you have to be very very clear about it today we are going to read about hyperadrenalism hyperadrenalism so we are going to read about the conditions of increased secretion of cortisol we will read about conditions of increased secretion of aldosterone that is mineralocorticoids we were are we are also going to read about conditions where there is an increased release of sex hormones or sex steroids okay that is the adrenogenital syndrome so we will see all the hyper but before that we have to understand that how the normal adrenals are functioning so the first signal is from the hypothalamus the cortical uh, the corticotrop releasing hormone acting on the pituitary to release the acth which is acting on the adrenal to release the cortisol once the cortisol comes into circulation what is going to happen it is going to give a feedback inhibition it is going to give a feedback inhibition and suppress the release of cortico crh as well as it is going to inhibit the release of acth so i hope most of you you are aware of this you have read about this in physiology yes so with this concept in our mind we are now going to start the hyperadrenalism today's topic of discussion so let us start today's topic of discussion so the adrenals as we have already discussed as we have already seen the adrenals they are a pair of endocrine glands okay which are located just above the kidneys so they are also called as the suprarenal glands and they are having a combined weight of approximately 4 to 5 grams okay now there are two important parts of the adrenals as we have already seen so there is an adrenal cortex and then there is an adrenal medulla so if you look over here if you look at the adrenal medulla the adrenal medulla is composed of predominantly the chromaffin cells and then to a lesser extent they have supporting cells called as the sustentacular cells and the major role of the chromaffin cells is to release catecholamines 
Okay, this is the basic function of the adrenal medulla. But if you look at the adrenal cortex, so the adrenal cortex, if you see, they are having three important zones that we have already discussed. Today we are going to discuss mainly about the adrenal cortex. Okay, we are going to uh, discuss in details about the adrenal cortex, and we are going to discuss how excessive amount of hormone is released from the adrenal cortex, and what are the different diseases. That is what we are going to discuss today. And tomorrow we are going to discuss about the adrenal medulla. So, regarding the cortex, if you see, there are three important zones as we have already discussed. The outermost layer is the zona glomerulosa, which is mainly producing mineralocorticoid. The most important being aldosterone. Then we are having the zona fasciculata, which is the middle layer, which is comprising seventy-five percent of the cortex, comprised of lipid-laden cells. which is basically mainly responsible for production of glucocorticoids most importantly the cortisol and lastly we are having the zona reticularis which is the innermost layer of the cortex which is very close to the adrenal medulla and almost abuts the adrenal medulla and whose major function is the secretion of sex steroids the estrogen progesterone and the androstenedione or the uh, androgens so basically today we are going to discuss mainly about the adrenal cortex and mainly we are going to discuss in details about hyperadrenalism that is hyper function of the adrenal cortex or the cortex of the adrenals tomorrow we are going to deal with hypoadrenalism that is the decreased secretion of the ad, the hormones from the adrenal there will be adrenal cortical insufficiency and we will also read about the adrenal medulla tomorrow but today we are going to read in details about hyperadrenalism which encompasses three important aspects one is the cushing syndrome which is characterized by excessive release of cortisol hyperaldosteronism characterized by increased secretion of aldosterone adrenogenital syndrome characterized by viralism where is an excessive release of sex hormone so these are the three things we are going to discuss in details to today and tomorrow we are going to understand about the adrenocortical insufficiency primarily there can be acute adrenocortical insufficiency also called as adrenal crisis primary chronic adrenocortical insufficiency called as addison's disease and lastly secondarily there can be adrenocortical insufficiency is this point crystal clear to everyone the basic classification of the diseases of the adrenal cortex the hyperadrenalism and hypoadrenalism so today we are dealing with the adrenal cortex so the first very important thing that we are going to discuss is called as the cushing syndrome now remember cushing syndrome and cushing disease they are not the same thing okay so cushing syndrome is basically a constellation of features characterized by excessive amount of cortisol in the circulation that is we call it as a hypercortisolism characterized by excessive amount of glucocorticoid level in the circulation okay and the cushing syndrome can be of two main types they can be exogenous or it can be endogenous so whenever we are giving excessive amount of steroids from the outside that is called as exogenous cushing syndrome in other situation when our body is producing excessive amount of cortisol we are calling it as endogenous cushing syndrome now remember out of exo and endogenous the most common cause of cushing syndrome is exogenous or iatrogenic administration of steroids now whenever there will be an excessive amount of steroids in the body from outside then what is going to happen they are going to cause feedback inhibition so the levels of acth is going to come down and because the level of acth is down they are not going to stimulate the adrenals so there will be bilateral atrophy of the adrenal glands and very importantly in this condition the zona glomerulosa will be of normal thickness there will be normal thickness of the zona glomerulosa okay so the exogenous variety of the cushing syndrome or the exogenous or the iatrogenic administration of steroid is the most common cause of cushing syndrome now this is in case is the overall condition now when we are looking at the endogenous cause of cushing syndrome it can be of two types it can either be acth dependent that means the pituitary is releasing excessive amount of adrenocorticotrophic hormone because of which there is hyperadrenalism so it is acth dependent and the cause lies within the pituitary or it is acth independent acth independent means that the adrenals do not depend on the acth it is by itself producing excess amount of hormones 
is this point very clear so you have to understand that among the endogenous causes the pituitary cause or the acth dependent cause is constituting 70 to 80% of the cases whereas the acth independent causes they are constituting 20 to 30% of the cases so remember the, among the endogenous cause of of your cushing syndrome the acth dependent or the pituitary is the most important cause comprising 70 to 80% and among the pituitary causes remember the most common cause of endogenous cushing syndrome is cushing disease Cushing disease is a condition characterized by a pituitary adenoma or a hyperplasia, and it is the most common cause of ACTH dependent, uh, ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. Or overall, if you see, it is the most common cause of endogenous Cushing syndrome. Okay, other causes, which is basically comprising five to ten percent of the cases, is ectopic ACTH production secondary to any kind of a tumor, and or ectopic CRH production. That is. from the hypothalamic tumor this is very very rare so i hope you have understood the acth dependent causes and among them the most common cause is the cushing's disease remember cushing syndrome is a condition characterized by excessive hypercorticosolism that is excessive glucocorticoids in the circulation or excessive cortisol whereas cushing's disease is a term used whenever it is occurring because of a pituitary adenoma or pituitary hyperplasia is this very clear what is the difference between cushing syndrome and cushing disease okay now endogenously if you see endogenously there can be other cause that is acth independent cause now what do you mean by acth independent that means it is not dependent on the acth so that means it is not dependent on the pituitary that means the adrenals are playing a role so over here the acth independent causes are contributing 20 to 30% cases of the endogenous causes of cushing syndrome okay so over here around 10 to 20% occurs because of unilateral adrenal adenoma and 5 to 7 percent cases occurs because of a unilateral adrenal carcinoma so adrenal neoplasms they constitute approximately 20 uh, around 15 to 30 percent of the cases now there are other rare causes which are comprising less than 2 percent of all the acth independent or of all the cases the number one case is a bilateral macronodular adrenal hyperplasia wherein there is a hyperplasia and the adrenal uh, nodule is more than 10 mm in size or they can be bilateral micronodular adrenal hyperplasia wherein the size of the nodule is less than 10 mm so there are two important hyperplasias bilateral macronodular adrenal hyperplasia and bilateral micronodular adrenal hyperplasia other very rare causes are macune albright syndrome or bilateral adenomas or carcinomas so this is the classification of cushing syndrome what are the exogenous causes what are the endogenous causes what are the acth dependent cause what are the acth independent cause so just to say the most common overall cause of cushing syndrome the one answer will be iatrogenic or exogenous administration of steroids or the most common endogenous cause will become your cushing's disease okay or acth dependent or pituitary disease okay whereas the most common acth independent cause will be a unilateral adrenal adenoma or a carcinoma okay so now we are going to start most importantly with the pituitary cushing's disease so let us begin with the pituitary cushing's disease which is acth dependent and which is com basically responsible for your 70 to 80% of all the endogenous cases of cushing syndrome so acth secreting pituitary adenoma is accounting for 60 to 70% of endogenous cases of cushing syndrome it is affecting the women four times more common as compared to males and most of the cases they are nothing but acth producing pituitary microadenomas now remember macroadenomas and hyperplasias okay they are very rare in the pituitary gland so because of the excessive release now because over here there is a pituitary tumor so they are going to release what the acth so the levels of acth will become very high so the adrenals will show bilateral adrenal enlargement to the tune of up to 30 g so the normal size the normal what was the weight of the adrenal was around 4 to 5 g but in case of this disease it is becoming as high as 30 g now the adrenal cortex becomes diffusely thickened and variably nodular and they can also show diffuse hyperplasia 
So under the microscope, what you are going to see that the cortex becomes hyperplastic. So you will see an extended lipid poor zona reticularis, which is surrounded by an outer zone of vacuolated lipid rich cell. Okay, this lipid rich cell is nothing but the zona fasciculata, which is containing excessive amount of lipids. And that is why it is giving the yellowish color. Okay, so this very important, the first important cause that is the ACTH dependent cause that is the pituitary Cushing's disease that is nothing but the pituitary adenoma. So remember, most commonly over here that we are having is your pituitary microadenoma, most commonly in the pituitary Cushing's disease. Okay, and very importantly, there is a bilateral adrenal enlargement. So it's very simple. Excessive ACTH released by the pituitary that is going to stimulate both the glands and there will be a bilateral adrenal enlargement. Excuse me. Now, remember over here, mostly they are diffusely thickened, but they will show variable nodularity, but the nodules are not very clearly seen. Okay. Now the ectopic ACTH. Now, for example, now in the previous case, in the previous case, the source of ACTH was our pituitary. Now, sometime the source of ACTH might be an ectopic source. 5 to 10% of the endogenous cases are because of this ectopic. Ectopic means what? that from other ectopic or unusual side, the ACTH is becoming secreted. So this is most common in men and this occurs secondary to some carcinoma. So ectopic ACTH production, as you will recall, the paraneoplastic syndrome as a part of that. So most commonly it occurs secondary to small cell carcinomas of the lung. Okay. Then there are other carcinoids. See, remember, and other neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, thymus, pancreas, all of them. <clears throat> now, very importantly, remember, what is the difference between neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoids? There is not much difference. Low-grade neuroendocrine tumors are called as carcinoids. And if you have to pick up a single answer, if in the option only neuroendocrine tumors are there, so you will choose neuroendocrine tumor. If in the option you are having carcinoids and small cell carcinoma, then you are going to choose the small cell carcinoma more than anything else. Okay, so very, very importantly is this thing. And there are other tumors which can ectopically secrete the ACTH like the medullary thyroid carcinoma, gastronoma, pheochromocytoma, and prostatic carcinoma. Again, as it is, uh, as over here, there is excessive amount of ACTH in the circulation. So again, there will be bilateral adrenocortical hyperplasia caused by hyperplasia of the zona fasciculata cells. Okay, zona fasciculata cells. So these are the most important ACTH dependent causes. That is the pituitary Cushing's disease. We have already discussed the, the Cushing's disease and the ectopic ACTH. And as I told you, the ectopic CRH release is very, very rare cause. Now we are going to see certain ACTH independent cause. What is the meaning of ACTH independent? That means now, now whatever excessive secretion of the hormone from the adrenals will occur, that will occur because of the adrenal. It is not going to occur secondary to any other cause. So primary adrenal tumor, whether it be an adenoma or be the carcinoma, they are the most common cause of ACTH independent Cushing syndrome. And out of them, the adenomas are more common as compared to carcinoma. So 10 to 20% cases of endogenous uh, Cushing syndrome is occurring because of primary adrenal adenoma and 5 to 7% cases occurring because of carcinoma. And as a whole, the, AC, the most common ACTH independent cause of Cushing syndrome would be adrenal neoplasm. Now, very, very important thing you try to understand because in this case, okay, the amount of cortisol is more in the circulation because the adrenals are secreting. So they are going to cause feedback inhibition of ACTH, which is being released by the pituitary. Yes or no? So there will be decreased ACTH in the circulation. So very, very important thing over here you have to understand. In the ACTH dependent variety, the amount of ACTH was more. But in the ACTH independent variety, the amount of ACTH will be less. Now, as a result, if the ACTH is less, there will be atrophy of the opposite adrenal gland as well as the adjacent adrenal cortex will also become atrophied because there is a redu re reduction in the secretion of ACTH. Now, very remember that in comparison to adenomas, the carcinomas, they are having more marked increase in the cortisol levels. And very important thing, the carcinomas, adrenal carcinomas, they show mutation in the beta catenin that is CTNNB1, TP53 mutation that is a tumor suppressor gene and MEN1 mutation that is the PRKAR1A uh, uh, gene mutation is seen.
Okay, so this mutation, that is the mutation in the PRKR1A, is seen is also present in case of adenomas, whereas the first three is present exclusively in carcinomas. Now we have to understand one very important thing over here that both the adenomas as well as carcinomas of the adrenal, if you see, they are more common in women between 30 to 50 years of age. So the adenomas they are smaller as compared to the carcinomas which are larger. The weight is approximately less than 30 gram, whereas the, over here the weight can go up to 200 to 300 grams and capsule is present over here whereas they have uh, they are often unencapsulated and under the microscope they are much more anaplastic in nature so this is the first important cause of ACTH independent Cushing syndrome that is primary unilateral adenoma or a carcinoma or a adrenal neoplasm the second very important cause, ACTH independent cause of adrenal hyperplasia, that is very rare. As I told you, these are comprising less than 2% of the cases overall. Okay, so we are having over here macronodular, bilateral macronodular and bilateral micronodular hyperplasia. So the basic cutoff point is around 10 millimeters. Okay, so if it is more than 10, we will call it as macronodular. If it is less than 10, we will call it as micronodular. So coming to the macronodular variety over here, the familial or these sporadic cases, there is a, uh, they are characterized by the mutations in the ARMC5 gene. Whereas in the sporadic cases, in the true sporadic cases, if you see, in the true sporadic cases, if you see, there is an aberrant G protein couple receptor expression. Okay. And over here, they are not only the under of ACTH, but they are under of other hormones as well. So microscopically, very important point over here that we have to appreciate is that, that over here, you will see prominent nodules. You are going to see of various sizes. And in between the nodules, you will see small microscopic nodules you will see small microscopic nodules over here whereas the micronodular variant of adrenal hyperplasia characteristically is going to show pigmented nodular adrenocortical disease so you will see pigment formation very very important okay and the other important uh, you know disorder under the micronodular disease is the carnies complex now both of these disorders are associated with mutations of the camp dependent protein kinase so whatever be the mutation the net result is excessive amount of intracellular camp okay so what you will see grossly you will see one to three millimeter darkly pigmented brownish black micronodular use and the intervening areas are atrophic. Now the pigmentation occurs because of the deposition of lipofuscin. Lipofuscin. Let me show you with the help of diagram this micronodular variant so it becomes very much clear for you all. So this is the variety if you can appreciate. Now this if you see, I will show you. Just wait one second over here. This is the variety I want to show you over here. Can you appreciate this variety everyone? Yes, can you see everyone this variety? So can you see that there is alternate areas of pigmentation grossly? This is the micronodular variety. And they actually show deposition of hemosiderin or brownish pigment, which is nothing but the lipofuscin. Lipofuscin. This is a lipofuscin pigment that we see. And this is characteristically seen in the bilateral micronodular adenocortical, hyper, adenocortical hyperplasia. Okay. Very, very important point. Lots of MCQs being asked from this particular important point. Okay. Now we have discussed in details about the Cushing syndrome along with it, with the, with the histological features of each, but there is a basic morphology of the pituitary gland. Okay. In case of the Cushing's disease. Now this occurs irrespective of the cause, whether it be exogenous cause, whether it be endogenous cause, whether it be ACTH dependent or independent, doesn't matter. There is a classical change which is seen, a very, very important MCQ. So in cases, in cases of your Cushing syndrome, characterized by excessive amount of cortisol, what you see, there's a characteristic change called as Crookie's hyaline change. Now, what is this Crookie's hyaline change? That normally, normally the ACTH producing cells, they are granular and basophilic. Okay, the ACTH producing cells present in the anterior pituitary is basically granular and basophilic. That becomes homogeneous and pale in color. And why it becomes homogeneous and pale? Because of the accumulation of intermediate keratin filaments. Very, very important MCQ. This is called as the Crookie's hyaline change. It is a classical feature of hypercortisolism and or Cushing syndrome. You should be able to understand that the Cushing syndrome and Cushing disease is not the same. 
is this very clear to everyone now what is very important in the exam for the exam purpose i i will just tell you okay just listen to this i will tell you so in the early stages the patient is having hypertension and weight gain with time the patient is going to develop truncal obesity and moon faces what are we reading these are all features of cushing's cushing syndrome syndrome okay we have already read this in physiology this is just a repetition there is accumulation of fat taking place in the posterior neck and back which we call it as the buffalo hump now there is a selective atrophy of the fast twitch type 2 myofibers leading to decreased muscle mass and proximal limb weakness now not only this the excessive amount of glucocorticoid or the steroid they are going to induce gluconeogenesis and they will inhibit the glucose uptake by the cells leading to hyperglycemia glucosuria and polydipsia leading to secondary diabetes and they will have catabolic now since there is an anti insulin action so there will be catabolic effects with loss of collagen and this loss of collagen because of that the skin becomes thin fragile and easily bruisable giving rise to cutaneous stria especially in the abdominal area that is called as cutaneous stria the cushing stria that you see i will show you with the help of diagram also because of this there is a resorption of the bones leading to osteoporosis so there will be back ache and there will be an increased risk of fracture in these individuals the steroids often suppress the immunity leading to an increased incidence of infections and the patients have mental disturbances hirsutism and menstrual abnormalities as well so if i show you very nice diagram over here if you look at this particular photograph i am sure most of you have seen this So, what is this characteristic face called as a buffalo moon, hump? Moon, moon faces. Face. Okay, buffalo hump we cannot see here. From the side, you will be able to see. Now, what is this? The there is a truncal fat deposition, truncal fat, central obesity that you call it as. Okay, central obesity. And what is this stria that you can appreciate? Yes, Cushing stria. Very good. This is called as the Cushing's stria. now actually there is no need for me as in a pathology subject to teach you all this but it becomes very important because the question will not come separately for you they will mix physiology medicine pathology together and they will form a question so those days are gone where you will selectively get questions from only pathology okay so that is why this all these i am trying to connect the dots so that you understand everything together okay clear to everyone now coming again to the notes coming back to our notes these notes should be your bible now coming to the lab diagnosis now very very important right now you must be thinking okay we will just mug up the lab diagnosis but you have to apply it because in the question they will give you that so and so patients came with so and so features and so and so is the lab laboratory findings of this patient so there you have to correlate what is happening now over here the 24 because it is a cushing syndrome so cushing syndrome is called as hypercortisolism that means the first important requirement to label the patient so as so is to have an increased level of free cortisol this is the first criteria that you should have yes or no yes now very important thing is that our cortisol secretion not only in cortisol many of the hormones in our body they have a diurnal pattern of variation that means they will be high in the morning again low throughout the day again at night they will become high so over here in case of cushing syndrome there will be a loss of diurnal pattern of cortisol secretion because there is some tumor at the level of the pituitary so they are constantly secreting so there will be a constantly raised level of acetate throughout the day that is abnormal understand that is abnormal or for example the adrenals are constantly secreting the the cortisol so the acth level is constantly depressed so again that is abnormal now the serum acth levels becomes very important to understand now for example if the acth is high that means what is the cause it means it is a acth dependent endogenous cushing syndrome yes so the cause is lying either at the level of the pituitary or it is lying at the level of ectopic acth or at the level of the hypothalamus if the acth levels are decreased that means what that means the cause is lying at the level of adrenals only yes so that is why the serum acth level is very important for you to understand and the next very important and the most important uh, thing that you will be asked in case of inicet in ams exam central institute exam is the dexamethasone suppression test what is the importance let us try and understand it is very easy you just need to have common sense over here now 
when you give this dexamethasone suppression test that means what i am doing i am giving steroid dexamethasone is one of the steroids i am giving dexamethasone to the patient and and i am i'm going to record what is the response not only that after giving the dexamethasone i am also going to measure the urinary steroid excretion it is also measured after the administration of dexamethasone and there are three important scenarios that we are going to get after this so the first scenario that for example the serum contains an excessive amount of acth the levels of acth is very high okay and after giving the low dose dexamethasone the level was not reduced the level of acth remained high okay also there was no reduction in the urinary steroid so the levels of 17 hydroxy corticosteroid was also high so both the serum levels of acth was high and the urinary steroid level was also high after low dose dexamethasone test i have given a low dose dexamethasone after that it wasn't now i then change that test into a high dose dexamethasone now after giving a high dose of dexamethasone the serum levels of acth responded and it fell down plus the urinary level of steroid fell down so once this happens it is basically the diagnosis is the pituitary cushing's disease that means there is a pituitary adenoma or a pituitary carcinoma something is there at the level of the pituitary is this very very clear so a uh, a high level of serum acth and increased urinary steroid secretion on low dose dexa plus decreased acth and decreased urinary steroid on a high dose dexa is confirmatory for pituitary cushing's disease you will be able to differentiate about this very clear okay the second scenario is you are having a raised acth levels which are not suppressed either by a low or a high dose dexa that means what that means the problem is not at the level of the pituitary someone else is secreting the acth that is an ectopic acth production by a carcinoma which is the most com common site of ectopic acth production which carcinoma yes what did i tell you small cell lung cancer very good small cell carcinoma of the lung fantastic now thirdly if you see over here there is a decrease now thirdly i took the serum acth levels it was already depressed that means what that means the problem is not at the level of the hypothalamus not at the level of the pituitary so the problem is at the level of the adrenal either there is an adrenal tumor which may be an adenoma or a carcinoma or exogenously someone is giving a, a glucosteroid so you have to see whether in the question any history is given history of consumption of exogenous steroid is there or no so over here in this condition both a low as well as high dose dexamethasone test is going to fail to suppress the urinary steroid level you should be crystal clear with this concept once you understand this with this concept your physiology pathology medicine all the three things are done even in pediatrics all these three things are done together nothing doing don't have to do anything else is this very clear those of you who are reading matthews okay for medicine or you are reading davidson or any other book go and read about this hypercortisolism a cushing's disease today only after this class so that that concept and that topic of medicine is also completely done once in for all okay very clear to everyone so everything has been incorporated in this particular lecture okay so the integration the vertical and the horizontal integration both of them has been there over here according to the latest national medical council directions is the hypercortisolism very clear any doubts with regard to hypercortisolism can we go to the next topic yes everyone yes okay so the next important hyperadrenal syndrome is the excessive secretion of mineralocorticoid okay that is hyper aldosteronism so which are the cells which are secreting the aldosterone yes tell me bolo which cells zona are secreting glomerulosa. zona glomerulosa zona glomerulosa okay they are secreting so the first thing we have already read we have read about the hypercortisolism that is one excessive secretion of cortisol one hormone is excess that we already read we understood we saw the scenarios we saw the causes now the second hyperadrenal cause that we are going to read is hyperaldosteronism now the hyperaldosteronism they can either be primary in nature or they can be secondary in nature so primary means what that there is an excessive secretion of aldosterone okay with reduced renin secretion that means in primary hyperaldosteronism the ras system the ras system is not activated so it is not secondary to anything 
Now, for example, if you are having shock, if you are having a heart failure, then for a prolonged period of time, there will be re renal hypoperfusion that is going to stimulate the RAS system that is going to stimulate excessive release of renin. Yes or no? That will become secondary hyperaldosteronism. It is secondary to heart failure. It is secondary to shock. It is secondary to renal hypoperfusion. Understand? So this is how you are going to differentiate between the primary and the secondary hyperaldosteronism. Is this concept crystal clear to everyone? Okay, this is characterized by increased aldosterone. Along with that, there is an increased renin because of secondary stimulation of RAS because of some other cause that we will discuss. Okay, so the primary hyperaldosteronism, what are the causes of primary hyperaldosteronism? The number one cause that is the bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. Now the bilateral, there is, it is characterized by bilateral nodular hyperplasia of the aldosterone secreting zona glomerulosa cell, which was the outermost cells of the adrenal cortex. Yes, clear to everyone. Now remember, this is the most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism contributing for 60% of the cases. I am telling you, do not read any other thing. This has been mentioned very clearly in the 10th edition of Robbins. Several times this question has been asked and several times, you know, in all the, please do not follow any other MCQ books. Follow the standard textbook. They have given very clearly that the most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism Okay, contributing 60% cases is bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. You all can go and check. It is clearly written. So remember, do not see any other MCQ book for this answer. This is it. Okay. Now, this bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism affects older age group and they have less severe hypertension. Now, very few cases, they show germline mutation of KCN J5 gene. Very, very few. Okay. The second important cause of primary hyperaldosteronism, we are reading about primary hyperaldosteronism. The second important cause is adrenocortical neoplasm. So the neoplasm, as I told you, there can either be an adenoma or there can be carcinoma and the adenomas are more common as compared to carcinoma and 35% case, 35% case of uh, of your primary hyperaldosteronism occurs because of solitary aldosterone secreting adenoma. That is called as Kohn syndrome. So this is not the most common cause. It is not the most common cause, okay, as it is given in other guidebooks. So do not fall for this trap. It is contributing only 35% of the cases, whereas 60% of the cases is because of bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. Am I very clear on this topic to everyone? Now it is basically happening during the mid adult life and the women is to men. Uh, it is more common in women. Now the mutations which are present in case of your adenomas and the carcinomas, if you see the mutations involve the KC and J5 genes in 50% of the cases. So most common mutation involving the adrenocortical neoplasm is the KC and J5. Other very rare is your CAC NA1H and ATP 1A1 genes. Now, mutation in all of them leads to a chronic state of excitation or chronic state of depolarization of the zona glomerulosa cell that is going to stimulate the release of aldosterone synthase uh, enzyme, which is going to catalyze, it is going to catalyze and increase the secretion of aldosterone. And this secretion is autonomous. Okay, okay it is autonomous. The adrenal gland by itself is secreting excessive amount of aldosterone hormone. Is this point crystal clear to everyone? Is this point crystal clear to everyone? Yes. Is this very clear to everyone? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the third important cause of primary aldosteronism is a familial hyperaldosteronism contributing to 5% of the cases. Very, very less. So, there are four distinct types of familial hyperaldosteronism. Familial hyperaldosterone type 1, 2, three and four. Now, remember out of them, the only one which is very common is the familial hyperaldosteronism type one. And this is occurring because of a rearrangement in the chromosome number eight, which is placing the gene CYP11B2. This is the gene responsible for synthesis of aldosterone or actually the enzyme aldosterone syn synthase. Okay. And what happens because of this rearrangement, it is kept very close to the ACTH responsive gene promoter, which is 
causing excessive expression of CYP11 B2, which is causing excessive synthesis of aldosterone synthase, and ultimately increased amount of aldosterone synthesis is there. But one good thing about this is that that this promoter region is ACTH responsive. So if you are giving steroid from the outside, it can suppress the synthesis of aldosterone. That is why this familial hypo hyperaldosteronism is also called as glucosteroid remediable or glucosteroid glucocorticoid correctable aldosteronism. So the level of aldosterone over here can go down by administration of uh, glucocorticoid or dexamethasone from the outside because that is going to suppress the action of this uh, gene promoter. So less amount of uh, uh, aldosterone synthesis will be there. Is this very clear? Is this very clear to everyone? So this is all about our primary variety of primary variety of hyperaldosteronism. Now there is secondary hyperaldosteronism, as I told you, wherein the only difference is that it is having excessive aldosterone along with that excessive renal release is there. Why? Because of secondary stimulation of the RAS system. So any condition in our body that is going to reduce the flow of blood into the kidneys is going to cause excessive renin release. Yes. So what are those conditions? Let us see. Decrease renal perfusion secondarily because of arteriolar nephrosclerosis or renal artery stenosis. Both of these conditions are going to reduce the renal perfusion. Secondarily, there's an arterial hypovolumia and edema. Why? Because of heart failure, because of cirrhosis, because of nephrotic syndrome and all these conditions. Okay, there is edema, there is congestion. So there's again a re reduced flow of blood into the renal circulation. And lastly is pregnancy. In pregnancy, there's an excessive amount of estrogen, which induces excessive renin secretion, ultimately causing hyperaldosteronism. Is this point clear to everyone? Yes. Now, if you look at the morphology over here, in case of hyperaldosteronism, how does the adenoma look like? Now, usually they are solitary in nature. Usually the adenomas are solitary. They are less than two centimeter in size, well circumscribed and involve the left side of the adrenals more than the right side. And the age group is around 30 to 40 years with women being involved more than the men. Now, over here, the enlargement is not that much and the adenoma is buried inside the gland. So the cut surface is bright yellow in color. Now, very, very important thing is that the cells over here are quite lipid laden, very much resembling like the fasciculata cell, although we expected excessive amount of glomerulosa cell. So this is one very, uh, you know, classic finding seen in primary, uh, you know, hyperaldosteronism because of the adenoma. Okay, so instead of excessive amount of glomerulosa cells, we have lipid laden fasciculata cells. Okay, and the cells are showing classical presence of eosinophilic laminated cytoplasmic inclusions over here called as spironolactone bodies. What are these spironolactone bodies? Because these patients are, 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 are because these patients are hypertensive because of an excessive amount of aldosterone. So they are receiving antihypertensive drug, which is a diuretic that is spironolactone. And that spironolactone is inducing a classical presence of eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion, which is called as spironolactone bodies. Very, very important MCQ. It is found after treatment with spironolactone. Now, hyperaldosteronism do not cause ACTH suppression. Unlike in Cushing syndrome, what was happening that basically excessive amount of cortisol was leading to a reduced amount of ACTH. So that is not happening over here. Okay, so hyperaldosteronism do not cause ACTH suppression. So as a result, the adjacent or the nearby adrenal cortex, as well as the contralateral adrenals, they are not atrophic. So this is one very point of important point of difference as compared to your Cushing syndrome. Okay, now, very, very important thing. There is a bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. Okay, bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. Okay, there is a diffuse focal hyperplasia of the cells of the and these cells are resembling the zona glomerulosa cell and the hyperplasia is very shipped from the periphery to the towards the center. So very important clinical feature of hyperaldosteronism 
Now, primary hyperaldosteronism. Okay, it is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. Now, remember, ninety percent of the hypertension that we see normally, they are idiopathic. Primary hypertension, they don't have any cause. Among those individuals wherein we see a cause, the most common cause of secondary hypertension or secondary to a cause is primary hyperaldosteronism, the prevalence of which is around five to ten percent. Now prevalence of treatment resistant hypertension. Now all those cases which are resistant to hypertension or who are resistant to any therapies, okay, all cases which are resistant to any kind of therapy, they are secondarily more commonly because of primary hyperaldosteronism and the prevalence of such cases is around twenty percent. Now we all know that the aldosterone they are causing excessive sodium and water reabsorption, uh, in, leading to increased cardiac output. So long-term effect, it is going to lead to cardiovascular compromise because of excessive load on the CVS because they are causing excessive resorption and excessive blood volume. So in the long term, there will be left ventricular hypertrophy along with decreased end diastolic volume, ultimately causing myocardial infarction and stroke. And very very important, very important is you all remember that aldosterone they cause sodium and water resorption. Now, because one positive charge enters the body, it also causes excretion of one potassium. So usually, it causes hypokalemia. But remember, hypokalemia is not that much frequent. And if present, they can present with weakness, paresthesia, visual disturbance, and tetany. Now, the diagnosis is made by an increased ratio of plasma aldosterone to plasma renin. Why? Because the primary hyperaldosteronism will have increased aldosterone and decreased renin. So, if this ratio comes out to be positive, then hundred percent it is a primary hyperaldosteronism, and then we can go for the aldosterone suppression test in this particular case. Is this very clear to everyone about the primary hyperaldosteronism? Yes. Is it clear to everyone? Sir. Yes. Tell me. In serum, then in case of primary aldosteronism, then uh, both will be high ACTH and aldosterone. ACT, see, in case of primary hyperaldosterone, see, it all depends. Over here, basically, there is a hyperplasia of the glomerulosa cell. So the fasciculata cells they don't show hyperplasia. Okay, so as a result, only over here we will have increased levels of uh, of uh, aldosterone only. We will not have ACTH high. Um, it has no connection with ACTH actually. Okay. Now, if for example, if for example, both Cushing syndrome and hyperaldosteronism can is present together, we call it as mixed syndrome. That that is also one possibility. Okay. But usually they are not together. And if they are together, we call it as a mixed syndrome. Is your doubt clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Now, now with this, we have completed the second important hyperadrenalism. That is your hyper. aldosteronism now last comes the very very important very very important concept that excessive amount of the sex hormones which are released basically from where from the zona reticularis so the excessive amount of cells over here will lead to a syndrome called as adrenogenital syndrome now over here over here first try to understand the normal thing okay normally the adrenal cortex they are giving rise to dehydro epiandrosterone and androstenedione that is converted into testosterone in the peripheral circulation and this pathway is normally regulated by acth okay i will first show you now there are conditions of androgen excess now whenever there is an androgen excess there are two important causes of androgen excess either it can occur because of adrenocortical neoplasm okay now over here androgen excess because of a neoplasm is more commonly because of carcinoma as compared to an adenoma and they present with viralization viralization means if there is a female she will have all masculine like feature and if it is a male they will have excessive of their own characteristic that is called as viralization whereas the other important cause of androgen excess is congenital adrenal hyperplasia and let me tell you this is a very very important mcq question this is your long answer question this will come in your medicine it will come in your pediatrics it can come in 100% it will come in all of your exams you will get this question 
what is congenital adrenal hyperplasia very 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 important so the androgen excess can be because of two things either there is a adrenocortical neoplasia or there is a congenital adrenal hyperplasia is this concept very clear now we will focus more on congenital adrenal hyperplasia now this congenital adrenal hyperplasia it is an autosomal recessive disorder and it is an inherited metabolic group of disorders having metabolic error because of deficiency of a particular enzyme now there are various enzymes which are deficient over here but out of those enzymes the most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia that we are going to witness is because of 21 hydroxylase deficiency oh, very yes. very important mcq that occurs because of mutation in a gene that is cyp21a2 gene mutation and it is responsible for 90% of the cases of 90% of the cases of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and this 21 hydroxylase deficiency can present as three important syndromes so i am talking about 21 hydroxylase deficiency it can present as either a salt wasting classic adrenogenitalism simple viralizing adrenogenitalism and non classic adrenogenitalism now before i go to any of the syndrome i am first going to make you understand the basic pathophysiology of congenital adrenal hyperplasia so please try and understand this first because everything has relation with this particular diagram and this will be asked in obstetric gynecology also okay so very very important normally from the anterior periphery there is a release of acth and this acth is basically acting on the hyperplastic adrenals because acth excessive acth stimulation is going to cause hyperplasia of the adrenals which is going to cause the release of cholesterol that is going to convert into pregnenolone now over here this 17 means 70 uh, 17 hydroxylase okay this 11 is 11 beta hydroxylase 17 this is 17 alpha hydroxylase this is 11 beta hydroxylase this is 21 hydroxylase enzyme okay this is the full form of each okay so just remember this now what is happening that normally if you see over here on the action of this 17 alpha hydroxylase the 17 hydroxy pregnenolone is going to convert to 17 hydroxy progesterone and over here because of the action of 21 hydroxylase this deoxycortisol will be converted to cortisol and then the glucocorticoid that is the cortisol is being formed okay so normally this cortisol formation is going to cause a feedback inhibition of acth and the acth secretion is going to fall this is what should happen normally normally this pregnenolone if you see will convert to progesterone okay and then with the help of 21 hydroxylase it will convert to deoxycorticosterone then with the help of 11 beta hydroxylase will convert to corticosterone and then will give rise to aldosterone and ultimately you will have mineralocorticoid similarly after this point of 17 hydroxylase you will see that it is converting the hydroxypregnenolone into dehydroxy epiandrosterone and ultimately androstenedione and you are getting testosterone and the sex steroids okay so this is what is happening normally now we are first going to understand that what is happening in 21 hydroxylase deficiency first let us understand what happens in this situation okay you understood what is happening normally so let us try to understand what is happening in the abnormal situation so let us try and understand so what is going to happen that over here till this step till this step formation of 17 hydroxy progesterone is there but over here there is a block so there is no production of cortisol cortisol is not produced so what is going to happen if cortisol is not produced in the serum of 21 hydroxylase deficiency there is a decreased amount of cortisol agreed everyone so this normal feedback inhibition which was there will it be working no it is going to stimulate further an excessive release of acth which is going to cause hyperplasia of the adrenals and as a result what is going to happen you tell me this excessive amount of of uh, acth will form more amount of this so what is going to happen more amount of progesterone is going to get formed yes or no 
and as a result what is going to happen because this is also required for this step so again this step is blocked so again the level of mineralocorticoid will be less so what is going to happen both the levels of cortisol and mineralocorticoid both of them are reduced but because of the excessive amount of acth what is going to happen this pathway is going to continue as normal and in more amount so excessive amount of sex steroids will be there so the patients will be having sign symptoms of viralism okay viralism will be there so there will be decreased cortisol there will be decreased mineralocorticoid and there will be increased amount of uh, sex steroids is this concept very clear why is this increase because of the excessive secretion of acth why acth is more because of decreased cortisol in the circulation is this point crystal clear to everyone yes tell me is this crystal clear any doubts over here anyone is having yes so 21 hydroxylase deficiency it is the most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and this is the sign symptom decrease glucocorticoid decrease mineralocorticoid because of this there is an excessive acth release which is further acting on the 17 hydroxy pregnenolone and because over here the 17 hydroxylase is normally functioning so the sex steroid production is increased is this very clear even if you don't remember anything just remember the points in case of 21 hydroxylase deficiency there is decrease cortisol there is decrease mineralocorticoid as a result there is excessive acth so there is no blockage in this pathway this pathway is all right the excessive amount of sex steroids over here is this very clear everyone so let us see now before we go any further i would just like to highlight the normal function of the aldosterone normally the aldosterone is going to stimulate the sodium and water resorption in the kidney and because the sodium will be resorbed so one positive charge has to be excreted so that occurs at the expense of potassium so sodium resorption will take place along with potassium excretion so there will be hypernatremia with hypokalemia so if there is an excessive activity of aldosterone then what is going to happen more sodium and water will be resorbed so there will be hypertension along with hypokalemia and decreased activity will be opposite there will be hypotension along with hyperkalemia so the first disorder that we are going to discuss over here that is the 21 hydroxylase deficiency very very important it has three important types the first important type is your salt wasting or the classic adrenogenitalism over here there is a total lack of 21 hydroxylase so no progesterone is converted into this so as a result there is no synthesis of mineralocorticoid so decrease mineralocorticoid there is again no synthesis of cortisol there is decrease cortisol that i have already told you now clinically the patients are going to present soon after birth why because the patients do not have any amount of aldosterone so what is going to happen all the sodium is going to go out in the urine so there will be salt wasting characterized by hyponatremia and hyperkalemia patient will present with hypotension and cardiovascular collapse culminating into death so this is all happening because of decreased amount of mineralocorticoid now as i told you because the amount of cortisol is raised so reflexly the acth level will be high that is going to turn up the production of the sex hormones so there will be excessive androgen or testosterone that is going to lead to viralization so females they can be diagnosed at birth why because there will be clitoral hypertrophy okay so at birth you will be able to, but for males because testosterone causes normal development of male organs so males will be diagnosed at 5 to 15 days later why because we cannot see any ambiguous genitalia over here so over here we will only diagnose the males when they will have salt wasting is this very clear to everyone about 21 hydroxylase deficiency okay very clear to everyone so this is the first clinical presentation of 21 hydroxy deficiency that is the salt wasting adrenogenitalism now the second important variety of 21 hydroxylase deficiency is the simple viralizing variety over here what is happening there is no salt wasting there is some amount of mineralocorticoid production is there so there is no salt wasting salt wasting is not there 
but over here what is happening that there is an excessive amount of acth leading to increased testosterone production so the child is only presenting with viralization that is ambiguous genitalia that is the only presentation that is seen that is called as a simple viralizing variety and approximately one third patients of 21 hydroxylase deficiency will just present with viralization without any salt wasting now the non classic or the late onset adrenal viralism this is the third variety and they say that nowadays this is more common than the classic variety so over here there is a partial deficiency of 21 hydroxylase so what happens that the disease is manifesting in adult life at a later onset and they have very mild manifestation so they will have hirsutism they will have acne they will have menstrual irregularities so these are the three important kind of presentation of 21 hydroxylase deficiency very clear to everyone so what will be the morphology if you see the morphology the adrenals they are bilaterally hyperplastic why because of excessive release of acth yes so everyone will agree with me on this the adrenal cortex is thickened and nodular the cut section is brown in color because of the lipid depletion over here and the anterior pituitary if you see they will also show hyperplasia okay so the lab diagnosis the lab diagnosis of 21 hydroxylase deficiency they are going to show excessive renin activity why re renin is increased can anyone tell me why renin is increased because aldosterone level is less so the body is going to by feedback stimulation they will increase body is thinking that they cannot produce the aldosterone and aldosterone is produced because of re renin stimulation so there will be excessive renin activity and you tell me you tell me if the block is over here if the block occurs at this level if you see the block at this level is there so as a result this is the substance that is going to be increased in amount in 21 hydroxylase deficiency 17 hydroxy progesterone is going to be increased so this becomes very very important diagnostic point of view okay so there is an increased androgenetic activity over here the signs of masculinization in females is there you will see because of an excessive androgenetic activity the females now infant females they will show clitoral hypertrophy plus pseudo hermaphroditism okay that means it will look like as if she is having a penis with ovaries inside so when the external and internal genitalia they do not match with each other we call it as hermaphroditism now because this is not true because there is a clitoral hypertrophy so it is called as pseudo hermaphroditism now post pubertal females okay they will present with oligomenorrhea hirsutism that means hair on the face and many acnes now in case of males in case of males excessive testosterone is going to cause enlargement of the external genitalia in uh, they will cause early puberty leading to precocious puberty and in older males they will cause oligospermia okay now signs symptoms of salt wasting we have already discussed so i'm not discussing again now one also very important factor over here is that not only the adrenal cortex okay patients of 21 hydroxylase deficiency over here the function of the adrenal medulla is also affected why since the glucocorticoids are required for catecholamine synthesis very very important that why the catecholamine synthesis is affected because glucocorticoids are necessary for synthesis of catecholamine and over here in 21 hydroxylase deficiency no cortisol is formed so the synthesis of catecholamine will be affected and not only that these patients are also having defects of the adrenal medulla okay so these patients with both the things reduced cortisol reduced cortisol and adrenomedullary dysplasia in the setting of severe salt wasting okay this leads to an ultimate hypotension and circulatory collapse in such patient so this is all about 21 hydroxylase deficiency is this very clear to everyone 21 hydroxylase deficiency is this very clear to everyone very very important yes, exam question you have to know this very very important exam question 21 hydroxylase deficiency it is little bit confusing but if you read two three times it will become crystal clear to everyone now in robins they have just given till here so are they asking questions till here no they are asking questions of even 17 alpha hydroxy deficiency as well as 11 beta hydroxy deficiency now you don't have to do anything extra over here we will be able to understand all things from this particular diagram only so let me just clear it out for you okay let me just clear this point out 
so that it becomes easy for you to understand this diagram was mainly in relation to your uh, 21 hydroxylase deficiency which is the most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia but over here what becomes very important let us try and understand now which hormone we are seeing is uh, not which enzyme is not available this is not 17 hydroxylase this is not available so again when 17 is not available what is 100% sure that is going to happen 100% sure what is going no to happen no cortisol and no aldosterone no why aldosterone will not be there aldosterone will be there see the 17 is not working that means this pathway is not working but this pathway is working correctly yes so increased mineralocorticoids will be there along with that there will be there will be decreased amount of cortisol so let let us see over here what we see over here very importantly in case of 17 alpha hydroxy deficiency the cortisol level is less but there is no problem for synthesis of mineralocorticoid so mineralocorticoid level will become high now very very important fact over here is that because the mineralocorticoid activity is there so the blood pressure will be high and the hypokalemia will be there also over here if you see the sex hormone production becomes less because over here over here in this situation there is no acth excessive secretion so the lab diagnosis is diagnosed by decreased amount of androstenedione the amount of androstenedione over here comes down okay so for example over here you just think you just think once i'm just going to repeat once more just think over here this is not there if this is not there this pathway will not work so decreased sex steroids will be there yes or no yes and also over here this pathway will not work because this is the only pathway which is going to work is this pathway because no 17 is involved over here so only excessive amount of mineralocorticoids will be there they will be decrease this and decrease this amount yes so this is the classical picture of 17 hydroxy deficiency now very very important is one thing is there the lab diagnosis will show excessive amount of androstenedione so this is very important in case of 17 alpha hydroxy deficiency excessive amount of this was seen in which deficiency 21 hydroxylase deficiency okay is this very clear now we will come to the last but not the least that is 11 beta uh, deficiency now let let me just complete this in this condition because the sex hormones are less so males will be having ambiguous genitalia because the testes will be undescended because testosterone production wasn't there and females are going to lack sexual development as well so they will have decreased uh, signs of sexuality 11 beta hydroxy deficiency what will happen 11 beta hydroxy is very very important for the synthesis of aldosterone as well as important for synthesis of, of cortisol so as a result what is going to happen the aldosterone production will be less but the cortisol production will also be this that is going to increase the acth production that is going to stimulate the sex hormone production as well so as a result over here the lab diagnosis is because the aldosterone level is reduced and over here the renin activity is also down why the renin activity is down i will tell you because already the blood pressure is high because of increase 11 deoxycorticosterone level now i will explain it to you i know no one has understood this point but i will explain it to you very very clearly listen to this very clearly this is the last heading that is the 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency so what will happen i will explain it to you in one second over here so think over here this 11 this is not working yes so as a result the amount of aldosterone will come down but the amount of deoxycorticosterone will be will be, become high and remember deoxycorticosterone is just like a brother of aldosterone and this is going to raise the blood pressure so when the blood pressure is high the levels of renin is going to come down so lab diagnosis based on decreased renin levels because aldosterone level is increased in case of 21 hydroxylase def uh, deficiency also but over there the renin levels will be raised to very very important but over here the levels of renin will not be raised again because of this what is happening over here very importantly uh the levels of uh, Uh, your uh, uh, cortisol levels over here is also decreased in this situation also normal to decrease so there will be an excessive acth release and as a result there will be excessive stimulation for 
formation of sex steroids it is very very simple to understand it is just like mathematics if you go back and read you are going to understand in detail so all these questions are asked in the exams very very common okay and these individuals females are going to show viralization so i hope you have understood all the three uh, syndromes associated with hyperadrenalism any doubts anyone is having